thank you this morning for the kingdom. Father, we thank you that the kingdom is visiting us this morning. As we have gathered in your Sabbath, oh, Father, words cannot express how precious your presence is. Father, we just stand at awe of you this morning. Father, take the words and that which you have placed in my heart. Father, give me the supernatural ability to be able to communicate that which your spirit has shared with me to prepare your body for the days ahead. Father, let, let my lips be as the pen of a ready writer that the Holy Spirit could be speaking this morning that Mike Lake could stand out of the way and that the Holy Spirit himself would speak from your word. And Father, give each person that hears the anointing to hear, to receive, and to implement the truths of your word we ask. In Jesus' name. I tell you, it's been a whirlwind week. I started out at uh, 2.30 Sunday morning getting up to make it to Virginia for the Restoration Fellowship International meeting. And when I got there, God showed up. I found out he was already there. It's probably one of the most powerful meetings, series of meetings that, uh, that I can remember in years. Uh, not only in the ministry of the Word, I mean, it ended up in the bang. We were supposed to be done by 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock. They were trying to get us out of the room because we were still praying and seeking the face of God, just enjoying and uh, I, I even had, uh, you can see it, it's, it's like there was a prophet down there named Ken Sturgill, and he was prophesying some things the minute he quit, and he said, well, I'm going to let Mike speak, and then I'm going to go back and share the rest, and I prayed the rest of what he was going to share. It was just that synchronicity of the kingdom of God. And uh, even in, the, in, in the, the board meetings, you know, sometimes leadership can't let their hair down. You know, you're not supposed to be vulnerable, you're supposed to be bulletproof. And uh, there, was, there was a transparency and a letting down of, the, of, of guards to where you could show what was really going on. And the minute you did, God moved in and began to restore it and to heal it. And to, I've never spent so much time either crying to where you wanted to fall out of a chair to laughing till you wanted to fall out of the chair. Of course, there was Dr. Coke there. Wherever Dr. Coke goes, a joke follows. And, uh, and they're much better than mine. He doesn't even have to be under the anointing to make them work. Had a wonderful time. But in, in the process of that, and, and this week I picked up a couple of books that, uh, you, know, God, you know, God is really good and, and timely that he'll put things in your hand as you need him and moving forward. And I'm going to mention a couple of books today that you guys really need to get because I, I think they're, they are essential with where we're headed. And so as, as I mentioned one today, write it down. They're, they're affordable. I think the most expensive one is $14 on Amazon. Uh, but it, it's going to give you some of the tools that you need to help undo the errors of the past and to get us lined back up with the kingdom. Uh, I think that's one of the themes that God is really speaking right now is lining back up with the kingdom. There was a place in our praise and worship this morning that with one ear I could hear what we were doing and at the other ear I could hear what was going on in heaven and they were in sync. That's when all we know, there, there came a place in the praise and worship was like, oh, <laughs> Okay, I just hit high octane, you know. It's, it's like God hit the nitric oxide and off went the engine, you know. It's, it's because what happens is when you line up with heaven, then what's going on in heaven, the power that begins to flow here. And we get in sync with that. And I tell you what, we need more of that. If you have your Bibles this morning, I want to go to Revelation chapter 1. We've been dealing with 1 John and I think, so we have already built the foundation uh, of First John of some of the things that, that he was uh, articulating in First John to prepare us for his last work, the book of Revelation. And uh, the book of Revelation, some have deemed a spooky book. It is not a spooky book if you know the one who's magnified in the book. And the believers that think it's spooky is because they don't know the one who's revealed in the book. That's right. Let's look at the very first sentence. This is so powerful. This book is not for the world. This book is not for those that do not believe in Jesus. This book is to the church. To the church. It has nothing to do with the world. It has everything to do with the church. Yet our theologies have made it just the opposite. The revelation 
of Jesus Christ, whom he gave un, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things that must shortly come to pass. That word there is bond servant. How many remember the entire series that I taught on bond servants? This book are for those who are bond servants to the kingdom. And one of the reasons why most of the church does not like the book of Revelation, it's not for them because they're not servants in the kingdom. They have established their own kingdoms and called them Christianity. But the Apostle John, the very last book, will say, can, can you understand just how wise God is, just how powerful he is, that this book would speak to us in this generation because we have forgotten who Jesus really is. Our theologies have taken us so far away from the real Jesus that God had to pen a spooky book to reintroduce us to who Jesus really is. Because I guarantee you, this weekend, the Jesus that is portrayed in most of the pulpits is not the real Jesus. Because we're, we're, we're bearing false witness. Jesus is not a laid back beach bum from California that everything's cool not because of grace. How many know going to the cross was a hard thing? <laughs> we act like it was a stroll in the park. The word revelation here in the Greek means to lay bare, to make naked. A disclosure of truth, instruction concerning things before unknown. Used of events by which things or states or persons uh, hitherto withdraw from view are made visible to all. Manifestation appearance. And so the real Jesus has been, our theologies have withdrawn him. But now God is saying, I've got to reveal him again. You see, remember me dealing last week that if I have that hope that is within me, it causes me to purify myself? Well, how come our, es our eschatological teachings, nobody's getting purified? The church right now is the dirtiest thing I think I have ever seen spiritually. It embraces everything opposite of righteousness and says we can do it because of grace. So it's time to learn Jesus once again. One of the books that I picked up is by Dr. Dan Juster, and he uh, co-authored it with Keith Entreter, I believe is how you spell this brother's last name, or says this brother's last name is called Israel, the Church in the Last Days. It was just published last year. And in it, he defines the purpose of last days, or the doctrine of last days, or what we call eschatology or eschatological uh, teaching. And for the most part, we and, and traditionally now in Christianity say, this is the teaching of all the stuff that's going to happen after we're out of here that we don't have to worry about. Isn't that the basic opinion? Rapture's going to happen. We're out of here. It's all the bad stuff that's going to happen to everybody else. But I want you to listen. Dan Juster is a highly respected Messianic theologian. The purpose of the doctrine of the last days in the Bible is that God's people may know how to order their lives as they see the unfolding of his plan. It is crucial in understanding the last days to immerse your life in God's purpose. You will thus become a catalyst for seeing God's purpose, or God's purpose for the world fulfilled. It is essential that we understand. That's why the Bible says there is a blessing for reading the book of Revelation. There's a blessing. You don't have to run God after a blessing. You don't have to throw money at God to try to get a blessing. Read the book because it's all about what's coming for you. It's all about what we're going to have to walk through, and this world is going to be shook as Jesus begins to reveal who he really is back to the church and back to the world. And so as I study it, it's, it enables me to set my life in order to prepare for those days. If you're waiting on a bus ticket to get you out of here so that you never have to go through anything, you're not preparing for anything, and that is the state of the American church. Now, that doctrine doesn't work in China. 
That doctrine doesn't work in Middle Eastern countries right now where Christians have to meet in secret because if the word gets out they're a Christian, they're assassinated in the streets. It doesn't work. It only works in America. And guys, right now with the political environment that's going on, it may change radically where we may, if we confess the real Jesus, we may have some things that we've got to stand against at a price we may have to pay. You see, the, the things that, that happen like this come out of affluence where there's no worries and there's safety. We forget that previous generations stood and believed something else. You know, I've mentioned before that uh, as we get into this that, that I'm premillennial, but people, the moment you say premillennialism, they think of, of standard dispensational theology. I do not agree, I do not agree with dispensational theology. In fact, the position I hold is what historically would be called the pre-1830 view of premillennialism as taught by George Land. And he has a wonderful book out there uh, that was printed prior to 1830. Dispensationalism, the proof of its error is the state of the body now that we've been under it almost 100 years. The body of Christ is in the worst shape it is, thinking that we're, we're ready to go. You're not ready to go. God would have to get you, scrub you down, uh, sp get, spray you down for spiritual lice and take lice soap to you because we, we say our contamination is fine because there's grace. Now, I want to read a section later on in his book because one of the things he does, remember me talking about ideologies in the garden. There was God's ideology when God began to speak commands, and then Satan added another ideology into the mix. And sometimes in our theologies, and that goes with different denominations, there can be a tacit ideology interwoven, tacit meant secret or unspoken, ideology that permeates that that begins to it begins to manifest itself maybe in in ways we don't necessarily recognize and dr jester did one of the most profound uh, unveilings of that tacit agenda within dispensationalism i have ever read and i want to read this uh, it's in a, a section on page 14 of his book called the kingdom of god and dispensationalism one of the key concepts of the last days is the kingdom of god the dispensational movement holds that the kingdom of God refers mostly to the earthly rule of Messiah in an age of peace, talking about the millennial reign. This teaching roughly follows this line. When Jesus came, he offered the kingdom to Israel, but Israel rejected the kingdom. Therefore, the kingdom was postponed, and God inserted a parenthetical church age that was not foreseen by the prophets. I got a real problem with that. That means that God, that God didn't know this was coming. The prophets couldn't see this coming. And so God had to put a parenthetical. That's, that's like, you know, in the middle of a statement that you're trying to make. You stop to define something or go somewhere else, and so you put it in parentheses. Dispensationalism teaches that the church age is a parenthetical age that the prophets never saw. That God had to say, wait a minute, Israel rejected the kingdom, so I guess I'm going to have to put the kingdom on hold for 2,000 years. So the outcome of that is for ever since the, the enforcement of, of dispensationalism, we stopped walking in the kingdom. Just think of the byproduct of that. This church age will end when the rapture takes place at the time the kingdom of God will be preached again. The gospel that was preached by Jesus and his disciples, known as the gospel of the kingdom, is not the same gospel that believers preach today. We are not to preach the gospel of the kingdom. We are to preach the gospel of the grace of God. The two are different. This is, this is the, the core essence of dispensationalism. That's why it's grace, 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 grace. I can do whatever I want to do, and there's grace, 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 grace. Because we're not preaching. Because the first thing that Jesus did when he showed up was said, repent. For the kingdom of God is at hand. When the church is taken away in the rapture, the remnant of 144,000 Jews mentioned in Revelation 7 will again preach the kingdom of God. This good news is that the earthly kingdom of God is about to dawn. Messiah will reign for a thousand years. This understanding of the kingdom rele uh, relegates almost everything into the future. 
There's a, there's, there's, a, there's a real difficulty with that because that's the exact same thing that the Pharisees were doing that caused them to reject Jesus. Moses did everything in the past, and one of these days, all this, they had a, when Jesus said, behold, these things are now fulfilled in your ears. Remember that in Luke? What was their reaction? They took him out of the city to stone him to death. Same spirit. In dispensational circles, one never preaches the kingdom of God, but the, go the gospel of God's grace. One does not talk about extending the kingdom of God. The phrase kingdom of God refers to a future age of peace. Our own view lies in great contrast to this. And I say, yes. That's why we're in such a mess. There's no kingdom being preached. This, disp this uh, dispensationalistic view is predominant in evangelical theology. No wonder God's bondservants must have the real Jesus revealed to them in the book of Revelation. The minute you step out of kingdom, you can't preach Jesus, not the real Jesus. I want you to think about that for a minute. No wonder is just a one side step from the Jesus that most of the church preaches to a new age Jesus. It's just one little step. Not a radical change, it's just one little step because everything's cool, there's no more. Uh, guys, here a few years ago, Dr. Mary Ann Brown told me this, that she was at a meeting, Dr. Jack Hayford was there, and they were talking about dealing with sin, you know, sin in ministers' lives, and this one apostle got up and said, we're beyond that, there's no more sin in, in, uh, in ministers' lives. And Jack, she said, Jack Hayford, there, you know, he has some, you, you know when he's about ready to pounce like a cat on a mouse, it's like, <laughs> it's like, what planet are you living on? He said, I don't know how many hundreds of calls his ministry gets a day with preachers struggling with sin. What planet was this guy from? That's where that theology leads down to. It's all grace. In the areas that hyper grace is preached, sin is out of control. You can't hardly find a minister that's faithful to his mate. You can't find one that doesn't embezzle tens of thousands of dollars from the congregation and turns every truth of God's word into an offering. I am nauseated about that. Dr. John Looper shared how that uh, one preacher kind of notorious for that always does the Isaiah 58. You know, Isaiah 58, so there's, an, so there's a $58 anointing, you know, for giving. And, and then another minister got up and tried to break down 58, what it means in Hebrew and stuff like that. And you, you could see an aggravation in John's eyes, but almost tears, because he said, these men know that there's no such thing as Isaiah 58. That was man-made. Isaiah didn't sit down and say, I'm going to write Isaiah chapter 58. The chapters and their numbers and the verse numbers are addresses we put to find them. The addresses are not inspired. The words that they wrote are inspired. God's not going to respect Isaiah 58 because it's, it's at 58 and therefore you've got to give a 58 anointing. I tell you what, I'd be looking for Psalms 192 or something. You know, the lost books of Psalms. We're going to preach from Psalms 1,192, and therefore we're going to have this 1,192 anointing. That is Gnosticism. It's charlatism. Yeah. And it's where we've come. I also picked up another book. I've, been having, I've had a lot of downtime waiting on planes and reading. This is another one you have got to get. $14 book, Who Ate with Abraham? By Asher Enterer. I N. T-R-A-T-E-R. -E I've never heard his name pronounced, and brother, if I have mispronounced that, forgive me. But I, there, there are some concepts in the Hebrew that we don't understand. You know, in the English, when you read the angel of the Lord, or a messenger of the Lord, or even the captain of the host of the Lord, like met with, that met with Joshua, and Joshua says, whose side are you on? He says, I captain the armies of God. You better worry about whose side you're on. Okay, we read that and don't even understand what it's saying. That the, the the English translation is extremely poor. He says that there is a there's a the Hebrew concept called shemich uh, I think that some of these this this phrase I have never heard pronounced. So forgive me, but it is s apostrophe m i c h u t. 
And it is the concept in the Hebrew of connecting two nouns together so that they define one another mutually and become one unit together. Almost like how we would hyphenate a word. Uh, the paired nouns in Hebrew are similar but slightly different. The first difference is that the order is reversed. The second noun describes the first. The meaning of the two nouns merge together and be they become virtually one word or similar to a hyphenated word. So in English, like we would say ball hyphen game. And so that's a, a game of playing ball. But in Hebrew, it would be game hyphen ball. The second noun defines the game that the first is being played. Does that, do you understand that? And so when you see these words in Hebrew, and, and there's many of them, that the angel of the Lord of the is not there. It is angel hyphen Yahweh. That God needed to send a messenger, so he showed up. Or how about this, man dash Yahweh. There's this man, angel, captain dash Yahweh that constantly shows up. It was the man dash Yahweh that showed up to Abram. You see, there, there's, there's something that we, we don't understand. That when, remember when, when the three angels showed up and ate with Abram and they were going to get ready to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? When Abraham saw him come and he recognized one of them and ran to him, he ran to him. He recognized God. He had met with God face to face, not in his glorified state, but in a state that man could handle. And when he saw him coming, he said, that's my friend Yahweh. And he ran to him and fell in his feet and he worshiped him. That was Jesus. That was Jesus. Joshua, looking on the other side, saw a man standing with a sword drawn. He said, who are you? And he said, I am Captain Yahweh. How's that for a superhero? With his sword drawn. Jesus was the one who brought down Jericho. <laughs> there are times when, and what's interesting he noted is like when he met with Abram, he, he, could, he could be a man and, and they could look at him and, and, and see his face. But there were times that he had to deliver in his glorified state. You couldn't look on him and live. But he did it primarily because the power of God had to flow through him to that extent to deliver. It was Jesus who hid Moses in the cleft of the rock and passed by because he was in his glorified state. It was Jesus that met with the elders on Mount Sinai. They could see his feet but no higher because the glory was there. All they could see was his feet. It was Jesus the Bible says that when, remember when the angel came down and slew 180,000 Assyrian in one night? It said it was the angel dash Yahweh. Jesus came down with a sword in his hand and killed 180,000 men in one night. That was Jesus. Well, that's not the loving Jesus. He loved his people. Our understanding, we have transformed Jesus into something he is not. Because we have not understood. They saw the glorified Jesus at the transfiguration. And yet still couldn't stand to look at him. They, they fell on their faces. Because he began to show him who he really is. But our theology has separated that powerful God of the Old Testament into a whippy, wimpy God in the New Testament. Well, why do you say that? Because there's no kingdom. You can't have a king without a kingdom. Kingdom means the king's domain. 
Guys, we have preached a Jesus that is so void of power, he can't even force his rule in his own body. Because there's grace. We want Jesus all the time to show up to beat up the devil, but we don't want him to enforce his own rule in our own lives. That's got to stop. That's why we have the book of Revelation. When Jesus shows up, the John will get into next week, that Jesus showed up in his glorified state, and even John, even then, and, and, and as mature he was in the Lord, it said, I fell as a dead man. He died. He fell as a dead man. And Jesus had to reach down and to, breathe, and to give life back to him because he said, don't die yet. I got a job for you to do. That's the Jesus that we serve. But because we have embraced the theology that puts kingdom to later, that means Jesus is king later. But if I'm going to be saved, I've got to confess that he is Lord. Did you ever see one of the old, those old uh, movies where they had knights and stuff, and you have King Arthur or some king? What happens when you go into the king's presence? You bow down and you call him my lord, my liege. And did you know that if his country ceased to exist, he stops being a king? If that kingdom is, is conquered and that kingdom ceases to, be, to exist, he's no longer a king. China used to have an, a, 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 an imperial dynasty, had, had this line of emperors. When communism took over, the emperor became a common man because he had no more kingdom. And when you take away the kingdom from Jesus, you turn him into a common man. He is Melech HaOlam. He is king of the universe. We want him to, to reign and bring down the devil in the external things of our life, but our theology doesn't permit him to reign and rule and to subject us to his kingdom. If you're not a subject of his kingdom... He doesn't have to bring things into subjection in your life. He's not ruling and reigning there. You see, the, and you can't have kingdom without authority. But what's the authority all about? Enforcing the law. We've done away with law because there's no kingdom. Can you see how the devil has set us up? Now, I want to jump to chapter 3 because I want to show you what happens when you have that kind of theology. That's why understanding Hebraic heritage is so vitally important. And unto the angel of the church of the United States of America. Oh, I'm sorry. That says Laodiceans. Maybe it's in the, the, the Greek. Maybe we could ferret that out. Laodicea, when you take it numerically, it means United States of America or Western world. These things saith the Amin, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works. You ain't done none because salvation ain't by works. Thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I'm going to fix you some hot soup, and we're going to sit down and, and, and brainstorm together, saith the Lord. Is that what it says there? Come, let us reason together, saith the Lord. No. It says, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. Guys, we're entering into a time of what has been called the church. God is getting ready to spew. And see, there, there's, that word spew is a strategic word. I'm leaving my notes, but this is okay. When God brought the children of Israel into Israel... God said, keep my commandments. If you start violating them, the land will spew you out. Now, the rabbis also teach that, remember how the gospel is first for the Jew and then for the Gentile? There, there's a Hebraic concept that as it is for Israel, so it is for the whole world. That God promised the children of Israel, the land of Israel, they are to go and to possess it and to establish his law, to establish his kingdom. When, God, when our descendants came to America and began to walk with God, our requirement was to take the land and possess it and to establish the kingdom. 
wherever we go, in whatever nation. That's how then the gospel and his reign is going to go from nation to nation to nation because we were to do that. So the same principles arise out that if I violate his commandments, the land will spew me out and another will be able to take control of the land. Because the church has bought this doctrine. We look at Washington and say, oh, it's all Washington's fault. They're all socialists. They let that come in. The church let it come in. The church let it came in because we no longer enforce the kingdom. We no longer preach that Jesus with a kingdom. We preach that Jesus that this gave everybody a free pass. And now we have theologians, prominent theologians, like the, what's the, what's Bell's first name, the one that does emergent theology, Rob Bell, is now teaching that even Satan himself can be redeemed. And Jesus said, I tell you what, because of the cross, is this all good? Demons come up here and I just pat them on the back, sprinkle a little blood and say, you know what, it's all right. No. My Bible says there's a lake of fire reserved for them. I don't know what these guys have been reading, but I do know what they've been smoking. Jesus, what we need is for him to come back and to, to exert himself in the earth in power. And he can't do it if he's not exerting himself in power in us because we're a part of a kingdom. Oh, but right now, there's some spewing going on, and if we don't reverse, if we don't reverse it, Moscow and Washington are going to become one. And it's not we can we go oh, well the elite the Illuminati blah 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 blah. Yeah, they may have perpetrated this stuff and poured money into this stuff so it would take hold in the body. We let it happen, and then we funded it ourselves hoping for a blessing. I almost feel like right now watching Christian TV is like watching those Ronco infomercials. Now hold on, we're not just finished yet. You give your $142.95 this week and God's going to send five angels. Now I know on the previous channel he said three, but I got a divine revelation it's going to be five and we're going to send the new doodad that we have created that's going to promise it to you right there. Send a little bottles of water if somebody gives $500 or more, how many know that's a good profit? Or, or, or sends you bread baked on an ancient oven that's going to have supernatural blessing because the stone supposedly came from Israel. I don't care what kind of stone you got. I got a life that's built on the rock. When you remove the kingdom... You don't have a leg to stand on. on. And here the Laodicean church was thinking, I have arrived. I'm going to tell the world, this is how you get it done. This is how you preach the gospel. Guys, I have been talking to people from Africa. I, I had a, a, a wonderful young Indian man from India that we're beginning to work with. I, I tell you what, it, intelligent, hungry for God, these guys are praying that persecution would come on the church in America because what we're preaching is destroying the church throughout the earth. It's destroying it. And it's the only thing filling the airwaves. God says, you know what? It makes me sick. I'm about to spew. That's the Laodicean church. Look at this. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increase in goods and have need of nothing. Lord, I've got an international ministry. We're on 152 satellite stations around the world. The sun never sets on our message. I've got a $5 million building. I drive a Jaguar or I drive a Lexus or I drive this. God doesn't care what you drive. What he cares about is what's driving you. I found out the Holy Ghost can fill a, 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 a pickup truck just as easy as he can a Lexus or a Mercedes. You say, well, I got an old Ford Focus. He can fill that too. He can make it go further. But see how we get so caught up in, see, 
I've got prosperity, and so I am so blessed. In the last days, we have many times, many ministries have prosperity because they have compromised, and the devil funded it so everybody would flock to that as the model. And you're saying, you're saying that just because you're small time, you got this little car. I'm, I'm saying it because it's the truth. And thank God, God got me out of that mess. You see, I have... I have been behind the curtain, you know, like on the, don't look behind, I've, I've been behind the curtain, I've been in some of those meetings of the ministry elite. Almost got caught up in it. I'm glad God delivered me from it because what goes on in the, those meetings are not the Spirit of God. I tell you what, this last week I met with some men that are doing some things in the earth, just a small group. But what was there was the power and the presence of Almighty God. I mean, it was, it, was, it was like slap your mama strong. That's Ozark for real strong. Because you better have your ducks in your row if you're going to slap your mama. <laughs> it was that strong. There, there was no manipulation. There was no worrying about who's got a bigger jet or who's got a bigger this. The heart's cry was, we have got to do what we need for God, whatever the cost. We will lay down our lives. We will pour in what we have into it for the purpose of God. Not what we can get out of it, but what we can rather put into it. What a refreshing situation. But most of the church in America says, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. You know what? God only has one option if that if, if you're basing everything that you your spirituality on what you have god's only option to save your soul is to take it away yeah, now do you see the reason that the financial collapse is pending god says if i don't do something to the laodiceans to take away their wealth they're going to hell Look what he says. He said, Knowest thou that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked? That's the state of the Western church for the most part. There's no more Jesus there than there is a man on the moon in many circumstances because we take sections of the gospel and we, we amplify those and take them out of proportion while ignoring everything else. Whatever happened, you know, it's like, well, you know, Jesus, you know, because of Jesus, there's no such thing as sin, and so you really don't have to worry about sin. What did Jesus say every time he healed somebody? Go and sin no more. Go and don't, vi don't violate the commandments anymore, even though probably here in about a year and a half I'm getting ready to do away with them. Just make sure in this year and a half that you don't violate them, and then after that, we're cool. That is not what the gospel says, but that's what our theologies say. And it's not a kingdom theology. If he rules and reigns now, Jesus came and he said, he said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. He even taught us to daily pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Every day he said, he said, that's how you pray, Lord, bring your kingdom in every situation. Bring your kingdom into every place that I walk. Now we have relegated it to some place in the future. It's got to be kingdom now. And Jesus said the kingdom of God does not come with observation. How many know people could observe the millennial reign? If Jesus is ruling and reigning in Jerusalem, you can observe that. But he says, behold, the kingdom of God is within. We have too many men and women that call themselves Christian, but there's no kingdom within because Jesus is not ruling and reigning there. If he was, your attitude about the word, your attitude about everything else in life would be a whole lot different. You're still on the throne, and you have this band-aid of, of churchianity on the outside that was, that was sold to you by Laodicean Incorporated. And you can go to hell with a band-aid on.
when you die, your, your soul goes to whichever kingdom you were operating in. You go to be with your Lord. And, you know, Lucifer doesn't even care to be called Jesus. There are demons that call themselves the Holy Spirit. Lester Summerall had to deal with that. He cast out a lot of Holy Spirits before he got to the real Holy Spirit in people. And see, it, 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 there, you only have two options, the kingdom of God or the kingdom that Lucifer brought when he brought the tree of knowledge into the garden and brought a different ideology into the garden. There's only two kingdoms. And it doesn't matter. what You, you could call it a, a uh, progressive kingdom. You could call it Christendom, you, you could call it progressivism, you could call it communism, whatever that kingdom is. If it's not Jesus ruling and reigning and enforcing his commandments because it's his rule and because I love the king because of what he did for me, I, I make sure that I am a faithful subject to obey his laws. I'm not functioning in a kingdom. I'm still in, I'm still in the other kingdom running around in Egypt saying, I'm in Israel, I'm in Israel. No, you're not. <laughs> Pharaoh still got you on strings that's working up the flesh. Grace is the ability to cut the strings and to walk out of Egypt and to start living like a Hebrew that has crossed over and living in another kingdom that has its own set of rules. And when you function in those rules, then all of a sudden the police start showing up to get rid of the crooks. You start recovering what was stolen from you because you're in another kingdom. And we learn how to be law-abiding citizens in that kingdom. Look in verse 18, Jesus says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. You know what? You can either be tried in the fire of passion now to have your lives purified because you love Jesus and you love the word. You have one of two options tried in fire now by the fire of passion or later on be tried in the fire of tribulation. It's kind of like pruning. You know, Jesus said, those that produce fruit, they, prune, they, you know, they get pruned, but those who produce no fruit, they really get pruned. So it's pruned if you do, pruned if you don't. The difference is the length of the pruning. You know, you, there's a difference in going into a tree and just kind of pruning the branches. But most of the time when Jesus has to deal with the church, the only thing that's left is a stump. And yet, if you can get 10,000 of those people together, they can call the church and move a God. It's a move going away from God, and they're calling it church. You see, what I'm after and what God is after is the remnant. Those that say, kingdom now. Kingdom now. And I'm not talking about all millennialism because there are some. You see, in America, there are, there are two schools of theology that are predominant. One is dispensationalism that comes out of schools like Dallas Theological Seminary, which is one of the biggest proponents of it. The other one comes out of Westminster Theological Seminary, which is all millennialism. And they're off too because they say, you know, what's, what's going to happen is we're going to win the whole world to Jesus. And once we get everybody saved and comes under his kingdom, Jesus is going to show up. We're going to bypass the millennial, uh, the millennial reign and go straight into the new heaven and new earth. We're in the millennial reign now. If we are, I want a refund. You see, the devil, you see what, what I have found is you have the middle of the road, there is God, and the devil always make a ditch on each side. Yeah. We're working toward the millennial reign, and we've got to go through the book of Revelation, to, for, first of all, to purify the church, and then to judge the world because of the wickedness they have done, because they refused to bow the knee to Jesus and respond to the cross. And because they refuse God's grace, the only thing left is, is the wrath of God. But you cannot respond to the grace of God without begin moving into the kingdom of God. If you don't, let me ask you something. Have you really been touched by grace? I know I'm smelling smoke this morning because it's making you think. That's why we have people come to the altar. They, 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 uh, the Wesleys, back John Wesley talked about easy believism. You just go and you say this little prayer and there's no change. 
If there's no change, you've not changed kingdoms. When you, change, when you truly change kingdoms, the old man has died, and all of a sudden a new man comes up from that altar, and he's like Jesus, and he's walking in another kingdom, and no longer is Satan his Lord, no longer is the rule of flesh his Lord, but the rule of spirit is his Lord, and Jesus is his Lord, and he now lives by this new birth spirit on the inside of him that loves the commandments of God because God wrote them on his, on his heart when he was at that altar. Now, how did we in America, that's something they're not going to teach you in school, in America, one of the battle cries in America, because we were actually fighting against the king, King George. And they knew they needed the help of God because Britain was the most powerful superpower on the planet. And this little ragtag band of men was going to fight against them. That's why they talk about divine providence. They knew that they needed God. If they, didn't, they, didn't, they didn't stand a snowball's chance in hell to get this thing done if it wasn't for God. And one of the cries was, and this, this was the model. In fact, it was on one of the flags. We have no king but Jesus. And somehow our theology has weathered that flag to where now it says we have no king. Why is that so important? I want you to go to Judges chapter 17 and verse 6. This phrase is repeated four times in the book of Judges. In those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. You see, if you don't have a king, you do what's right in your own eyes. And it is extremely significant that it was mentioned four times in the book of Judges. Four is the number of Messiah. It was in the fourth millennium that the king came, the real one. He was born in Bethlehem in a manger. He was born a king. And the angel said, talked about the king being born. When, when, the, when, the, uh, when the wise men came, they were looking for the king, weren't they? On the cross, it said, the king of the Jews. But now the church is acting like we have no king. Our theology's off, guys. And what's happening in the church, our, the way that we teach grace, we have taken away our king, and every man is doing what is right in his own eyes. Let's look back at a Revelation chapter 3, talking about the Laodicean church. Now, wouldn't, wouldn't it seem like God say, I know your understanding of grace? If we're, if we're under the age of grace, in which no works are required, why in all of the letters to the seven churches, the Holy Spirit brings up works? If there are no works, why is he bringing up works? He said, I know thy works. Thou art doubt, doubt neither hot nor cold. Did you ever see an unmotivated workforce? <laughs> Droopy dog emotion. Well, I know I only got one nail left to, to put in that board, and I might get it done this month. That's the way the church is about works unless it's something that affects your flesh. And then all, it's not, now, if it affects the kingdom, well, salvation isn't of works. You're just trying to bring me under works. You're trying to bring me under the works of law. I'm trying to get you into the kingdom. Because once you get into the kingdom, the devil will stop beating your head in because you're, you're saying you're following Jesus, but you're still in his kingdom where he can reach you. You're neither hot nor cold. Well, I, I guess, Brother Lake, I'm going to get around to reading that Bible. <laughs> I 
That feeds your spirit. That feeds your soul. Now, I know right now that none of us have that problem with the dinner table. You know, I used to think when Paul talked about buff buffeting his body, I thought he was talking about buffeting his body. I thought that originated with the Apostle Paul, the buffets. Because we will rush to feed the flesh. We will rush to, and all you can eat, I can do anything I want in the kingdom of God. God's still going to bless me when the Apostle Paul says, you need to bring that under control so that you get zealous about the works of God. And the works of God always, biblically and hebraically, mean keeping God's commandments. He said, I know your works. You're ambivalent about the kingdom. Ambivalent, big word, means, I, uh, I, I, I guess I can pick and choose. And I really, you know, the, the guys that say that, that, we're, that we don't have to keep any of the commandments or the laws because there's no curse, you know, and everything's blessing, those same guys will get up in the pulpit and tell you if you don't tithe, you're cursed. Well, make up your mind. Tithing is a Torah commandment, is a Torah principle. Boy, they like that one, though, don't they? Why? It affects their bottom line. That's right. That's right. Let me tell you something. Keeping the commandments will affect your bottom line. It will make life profitable. The Bible says, if you meditate there, then day and night, that thou shalt have good success and make thy way prosperous. How's that for a bottom line? Right. Maybe the reason we're constantly begging for a blessing is because nothing else in our life produces a profit. Oh, man. It's just some things to think about. We're like Jacob that's, this, that's wrestling with God, with God, begging for another blessing. And that, don't we forget about all the blessings. I just need another blessing. I just need another blessing. Why? Because you take your blessing and you put it in a bag with holes because you don't keep any of the commandments. No, oh, by the way, did you know that the angel dash Yahweh that wrestled with Jacob was Jesus? Let me tell you something. Jesus is going to begin wrestling with the conniver, with the, with the heel grabber. I want your blessing. I just want your blessing. I just want a blessing. I'm going to grab anything just to get the blessing. I'll send $500 to P.O. Box just to get a blessing. Jesus is getting ready to wrestle with his remnant. He's getting ready to, to touch the hollow of your thigh. Now, I've always been taught, you know, the, the thing was, you know, he did that so that his walk would change because he limped after that. But, you know, one of the things we don't understand from a Hebraic mindset, sometimes when they saw things with God, they didn't know if they were just seeing into the spirit realm or if it was actually physical. And so when God wrestled with Jacob, when, when Jesus wrestled with Jacob and changed his name to Israel, he gave him a physical sign that that was not just a vision. That wasn't just something spiritual. He laid hands on Jesus, and Jesus laid hands on him. And let me tell you something. If you really lay hands on Jesus, he'll lay hands on you, and something will change. The finite cannot come into contact with the infinite without being changed. If there is no change, you are preached another Jesus. If there is no hunger for the kingdom of God, you are preached another Jesus. If there's no reverence for the commandments because we so love our king who died and gave himself for us, then you're being preached another Jesus. What did the apostle Paul say? Because we, 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 need, to, we need to see, and I want you to go to Ephesians chapter 1, but we also need to, Really, you know, Jesus said, he preached, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. He said he, every day we're supposed to pray for the kingdom. We need to understand that this, this diluting of the gospel into another gospel actually has, it was an attempt of the enemy to delay the return of Jesus. Because in Matthew, Jesus said, the gospel, the gospel, this gospel of the kingdom must be preached in all the earth. Then the end would come. And so if the, if the kingdom is not being preached, we don't hasten the day of Jesus. We delay it. If it wasn't for dispensational theology, we could already be in the millennial reign today. Just maybe. Just something to think about. If we hadn't gotten so squirrely, 
You know that, that old Ray Stevens song about the squirrel got in church? It did. It just took over the pulpit. <laughs> And what do squirrels do? They gather in the nuts. But when Jesus is preached from the pulpit, he gathers in the sheep that know his voice and wait for the command of the shepherd. The command. Because only when he starts commanding is light and darkness separated and the chaos begins to cease. Look what the Apostle Paul says here in verse 8. And the eyes of your standing being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling. Not your calling. Not your calling. His calling. How many have read that and seen your calling? Oh, I want my eyes to be enlightened so I can see my purpose in the body of Christ. I want my eyes to be enlightened so I can see what my calling is. You'll never discover your calling until you first see his. He's the king. And when you discover his calling, your calling always comes into place. To discover what is the hope that you may know, the hope of his calling, what is the riches of his glory and his inheritance in the saints. Well, brother, I'm trying to believe to get my inheritance. You know what? I'm not worried about my inheritance anymore. I'm, I'm trying to get Jesus so he can get his. When he gets his, when my king gets his inheritance, I always get what I need. This is, this, these scriptures are so that your eyes would be open so that everything would become Messiah, King-centric, not you-centric. All of our theologies right now is self-centric. It's what Jesus can do for you. It's how Jesus is going to heal you. It's how Jesus is going to make you rich. It's how Jesus is going to buy you a new house. To the place that we think spiritual warfare is, I was believing God for a new car and the devil hindered it in that spiritual warfare. That isn't spiritual warfare. True spiritual warfare is taking us away from the word of God. The devil comes in and says, has God said? Has God said there is a kingdom? Has God said that there's sin? Has God really said there's commandments that we got to do? After all, there's grace. Same lie in the garden. Now, now the devil's trying to hang himself from the cross and proclaim the same thing. That is an insult to the body of Christ. Because Jesus said, if I am high and lifted up, I'll draw him in. I'm better than a snake in a tree. The devil started in a tree. I'm going to finish it in a tree. But when you start preaching another Jesus, you put a snake in the tree. Men's hearts long for a king. And democracy, this, this, this is an oxymoron. It's a paradox. Because we see it, the further you get away from God... And we can see that in the liberal progressive movement. The further, I mean, they, they don't believe in God more than the man on the moon. They, they hate this word, yet they long for something to worship. They get a leader in. Oh, he just moved me when he spoke. And then after he's in office, then they, they, they got to abbreviate it. JFK, FDR. And, and they, they, when, whenever they talk about them, oh, it was like Camelot. Let me tell you something. Some of the things that, that went on in the White House when, J, when JFK was there was more like Babylon, was more like, was more like a little whorehouse in Texas than it was. Come on. Just one skirt after another, after another, after another. It's a wonder that man can govern because he is just looking for another woman. That's what happens when you get almost absolute power, but you're not under the throttle and control of Jesus and the kingdom of God. But they, they look for somebody to worship. This, this last couple of weeks, there were Democrats in Florida that took the stars off of our flag and put the effigy of our, pres our current president there, and they, they, they got bewildered that the veterans got mad. I didn't die for that flag. I didn't lose a limb for that flag. I didn't go fight overseas. You know, all these people that do that, they never fight anything except righteousness. They've never gone and served in the military. And then they wonder, why, why is everybody getting mad? 
When you don't worship the God of heaven and earth and you reject his ways, you are setting up yourself because in your heart you know that you were created to submit to a king and to worship him. And if you reject God, the only thing left is an idol. And it, it is setting them up for the Antichrist. I don't know what initials he comes up with, but it'll probably be numerically 666. Oh. <laughs> Let's get back to Ephesians. <laughs> Look at this. The eyes of your understanding being lightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power. His power toward us. But we, we want to get the toward us, but it's got to be his power, his inheritance, his greatness according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places, far above all principalities and powers and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world but also in that which to come, and has put everything under his feet and put everything under his feet. That is a conquering king. The whole book of Ephesians is not so much finding out about who you are. It's about finding out who he is. And when I discover who he is, I am released to be who I am. If we don't have a conquering king, then we are still conquered by the enemy. Let me say that again. If Moses had not gone into Egypt and by the power of God conquered Pharaoh, where would Israel be today? Still slaves in Egypt. It had to be a conquering redeemer that even after they got delivered, one of the, you know, Moses is a type and shadow of Jesus. What happened every time the Israelis rose up to try to get they got mad at Moses because he was exercising, laying down the law. And every time he laid down the law, they rose up against him. God started killing them. Right. And what we have forgotten is Moses is a type and shadow of Jesus. Moses was the lawgiver, but he was also the UPS man. Jesus is the one who took his finger and wrote the Ten Commandments into stone. Jesus is the one who gave him the first four books of the Bible and said, this is the law of my kingdom. I am establishing a people, and this is the law of my land. And if you refuse to recognize that law, according to the very Torah principles, you cannot dwell in the land. And we wonder why we don't live in the land of blessing. You can't do it without recognizing the king, recognizing the law, and then you respond to that law out of love because of his grace. And then he gives you the grace to do it. How many of you know we're so far out in left field that we can't even see center field anymore? We really are. And 99% of what is being preached is not the gospel of the kingdom. It's come and get your Willy Wonka golden ticket and then God's not going to require anything of you once you... Jesus said, if you're not willing to leave father, mother, sister, and brother, you're not worthy of me. Well, you know, I'll leave mother, father, sister, and brother, but you know, my sin I like to keep. This is what our theology is anymore. That's got to die. I am crucified with Christ. I've died to sin. I've died to the desire to live in another kingdom. I have died to the desire of violating God's Torah. I have died to the desire for the things of this world. Yet I live, yet it is my king living in me. That's how you get to a victorious life. That's what John was talking about in 1 John. And if, if we do not do spiritual warfare from that perspective, you are not going to make it. We're going to be like the children of Israel that died in the wilderness and never get to the promise. Father, right now we confess before you 
that we have not made Jesus king in the preaching that we have done. We have not made the kingdom of God quintessential to walking with you, Father, because we have inherited lies. And Father, we repent of that. Father, we renounce that right now in the name of Jesus. The Jesus of the Bible says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I love you, Jesus, because of what you have done for us. I love you because you took my sins on the cross. You took my sickness and disease. You took all my rebellion and you nailed it to the cross and that blood was shed for the forgiveness of my sins. And I now lay my life upon your altar, the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 12, because it's the very least thing I can do. And I now live for you. I live by your laws, your statutes, your judgments. Not because it gets me into the kingdom, but because I am in the kingdom. Because I'm there, and I want to learn how to operate in this new kingdom and bring glory and honor and respect to my king. Father, let us return to your ways. Our, our desire is not to be spewed out. We want to heat up in the things of the kingdom of God. We want the fire of your Holy Spirit now to burn the chaff out of our lives so that when it comes time for the wrath of God to be poured out, we become like Shadmach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace because it won't touch us because we have stood with the fourth man in the fire. Father, give us that grace. Give us the grace to hear truth and to do truth and to move in truth. And Father, let us cast off the lies of the enemy that has perverted your word and let us draw unto the real Jesus who is sitting at the right hand of the Father and he rules and he reigns in power and in glory. That's the Jesus that we serve, Father. Let our eyes be enlightened that we can see him because as we see him, we purify ourselves, and we will be like him. And Father, we thank you, and we praise you for it this morning. In Jesus' name.